So last time in the lessons, we studied about general purpose input output and also about serial uh, part, which is called UART, universal asynchronous syn uh, receive and transmit uh, connection. So today we will study about timers, uh, which are common in all microcontrollers. Okay, so let's uh, see timers. All microcontrollers have some kind of timers. Uh, and the timer is actually what it's used for, but it is actually a counter. Uh, so it's just that it counts at a certain frequency. And as a result, after a certain number of ticks with predefined frequency, we can have something that happens after a certain time. And uh, we have two kinds of uh, timers. One is just timer. And the second one is uh, RTC, which is real time counter. So the difference is that usually timers without real time, uh, regular timers are used for high speed uh, timing, but real time counters are used for slow time, which is in seconds. So for example, timers uh, that are regular ones usually have a, a period of several milliseconds. So microseconds and milliseconds and the real time counter or real time clock Uh, these ones are usually configured to count milliseconds, seconds, hours, and minutes, and days, and so on. So I'll just uh, expand it a little bit. So real-time clock, this is milliseconds, uh, seconds, minutes, hours, days and so on. And let's just check out how the timers slash counters are built inside the microcontroller. Uh, let's use, for example, um, a data sheet of a microcontroller to understand how it's used and how to configure it properly. Da -da -da. So, Usually, microcontrollers have separate timer and real-time clock timer, uh, but, but they are actually built inside the same way. It's just one is really slow and the other one is really fast. So let's see timers, timer description. And uh, basically, timer in reality is just a counter which counts for example up so it receives some uh, square wave input usually it's just um, microcontrollers uh, clock and the clock makes ticks and the timer counts into its counter plus one on each tick so for example let's just put it in, uh, in some numbers so we have something to talk about. For example, uh, let's say that our microcontroller runs at 14 megahertz. So um, frequency of uh, the MCU is 14 megahertz, which is 14,000 million 14 million ticks per second, okay? And um, this is an internally generated uh, clock and it makes the microcontroller work and our microcontroller just runs from this 14 megahertz uh, uh, clock. I'll just uh, immediately give you some other examples. For example, your computer your desktop computer probably runs at 2.5 gigahertz clock. 
uh, with variable speed to sometimes improve performance and sometimes to reduce the frequency to save power. Microcontrollers usually run between one megahertz and maybe 100 megahertz. Um, regular microcontrollers, you know, the cheap ones like uh, Arduino microcontrollers, they run uh, at one megahertz to 20 megahertz. Our um, simplicity, uh, our Silicon Labs chips that we will use in lab, their default frequency is 14 megahertz, but you can actually change it. Let's just initially assume that it's 14 megahertz. And also you can of course buy some microcontrollers that can run up to 500 megahertz and some Linux embedded uh, microcontrollers that run 1.5 gigahertz, for example. But in our case, uh, since we will be using in labs a microcontroller that runs at 14 megahertz, we'll use this as an example. So our microcontroller runs at 14 megahertz and we uh, turn on one of the built-in peripherals. And uh, let's see, I'll switch off the mic of one of the participants, yeah. Um, so this thing runs at 14 megahertz <coughs> and we will be attaching a timer to this clock. So we will just use some, usually microcontrollers have multiple timers and they are just named timer one, timer two, timer zero, timer three and so on, as many as the number of uh, timers. To find out how many timers we have, we can check out the data sheet and it says four timers counters <coughs> and one real time counter, okay? And one pulse counter, okay? So we have four timers counters, the regular ones. So in our example, let's just say that we will use timer number zero and we will just attach it to uh, this MCU clock. So it means that this thing, this timer zero, will receive 14,000 ticks per second. So uh, what is the time of each tick? So, uh, or the period of this uh, timer Uh, so, uh, time for, okay, I'll, I'll call it big T, the period. T is equal to one divided by frequency. So, each tick is one divided by 14 million. It means each tick is 0.7. Uh, microseconds. So I'll just multiply it with 1 million. Oh, okay. I'll multiply it with uh, 1 billion. So it's 71 nanoseconds. Um, so it is 71.4 nanoseconds, okay? And uh, so basically uh, timer zero has a special register, which is called counter inside of this timer peripheral. And it just increments by one on each tick. Uh, initially it's zero, and then it just increments by one. So it is, uh, and each tick happens after 71.4 nanoseconds, okay? So um, then the timer has also some top value, the maximum value to which the counter counts. And when it reaches top, it just rolls over and starts from zero again. So we have top register and um, these timers, you have to check out in datasheet how many bits these timers have. Uh, 
because they have some maximum value to which they count. So let's check out counter register number of bits. In uh, you can find it in um, peripherals register description. So here's some control registers with which you configure the timer. And there is also a register which is called interrupt flags, da, 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 da. counter top value, counter value register. And from this description, we can see that the counter is 16 bits wide. So from zero to 15. So it's a 16 bit counter. So it's a 16 bit counter. So the maximum value, uh, so maximum value is zero X F F F F, which is two to the power of 16 minus one. So the counter can count up to this value, 65,535. <clears throat> after this many ticks, it will just roll over and begin again from zero. So you cannot count with this uh, counter higher values, okay? Um, next thing that we can do is we can calculate what is the total time for the counter to count from zero to its maximum value. So we know the full period of the counter. So full period is counter's maximum value times uh, each ticks time. So it is 71.4 times 65535. And now we will divide it by 1000 and 1000 again. So we can see that it's 4.68 uh, microseconds. Uh, so, sorry, it, is, it was nanoseconds, micro, and this is milliseconds. So, with this counter, we can count time up to 4.68 milliseconds, after which it will overflow and start from zero. So we cannot really measure longer times with this. But what we can do, and what is oftentimes done, uh, timer also has a compare value. So when it counts up to a certain value, like here, it is visible in this place, timer CCX. So it's capture compare register. We can write a value into it. And when the counter reaches this value, it can fire an interrupt. And you can, for example, do something at that moment. Or alternatively, you can uh, set the top value to some value to which the counter should count. And when the counter reaches top, then you can also have interrupt. So we actually have three different interrupts that we can make using a timer counter. One is overflow. Overflow happens when the ca uh, timer counts to the top value. The second, um, interrupt is underflow interrupt when the timer counts to zero. So either it counts down or it overflows and goes back to zero. This event is called underflow. And when the counter counts to the value that we uh, write into the capture compare register, it is called uh, capture compare interrupt. And uh, for example, in these uh, timers, counters, they have three registers. So you can have three interrupts. You can have a 
ca capture compare value zero, one, and two, and you write some values. And when the timer counts to that value, it all uh, fires interrupt, and you can do something after a certain time. So uh, I'll try to show it with an example. Let's say that uh, you want to, for example, blink an LED and you want the LED uh, to be on for, for example, one millisecond and then one millisecond you want it to be off. Or maybe you want to put some impulses on some other GPIO or something like that. So let's say you want uh, LED on for one millisecond, LED off for one millisecond. Um, so to do this, you have to use the timer counter and you just have to do some uh, mathematical calculations to determine up to what number should the timer count to have interrupt with one millisecond uh, period. <coughs> so initially, uh, counter is equal to zero. I'll call it just uh, C and T because that's the name of the register counter register equals to zero. And after each 71.4 nanoseconds, it's incremented by one. So the question to you is how many ticks are inside one millisecond? Can you maybe calculate and write it in the chat or answer with your voice? Timer runs from 14 megahertz. So each tick happens after 71.4 nanoseconds, and you want to calculate at what counter value one millisecond will have passed. So one millisecond is equal to 1000 microseconds is equal to 1 million uh, nanoseconds. Can you write uh, some guesses in the chat? Let's see, where is the chat? Chat is right here. Let's see. Okay, so what is your guess? Counter increments by one on every 71.4 nanoseconds and how many ticks fit in one millisecond or one million nanoseconds. Take your time. It's like uh, time the same number 71.4 times 10 power to negative 6. Uh, time 10 power to 6. Uh, can, you, can you say it again? Like the same 71.4 times 10 power by 6. And what will you get? Well, yeah, 71.4 times 10 power by 6, that's like 71 million. Point four hundred, I think. Okay, and what is that number? That's the uh, the like the clocks or the ticks per second per millisecond. Yes, uh, I don't think that it is correct. So what you're saying is that you multiply seventy one point four nanoseconds times one million nanoseconds and what do you get you Not get seven... just just uh time one million it... 
Yeah. And what you will get is 71.4 uh, milliseconds. Milliseconds. Oh. Okay, but that's not what you need to get. You need oh, to yeah. get how many ticks fit in one millisecond. Oh, yeah. Got it. Sorry. But you can try to calculate that one just as divide, well. Just divided by one second. Divide by what? Divided by 71.4. Exactly. One million nanoseconds divided by 71.4 <coughs> nanoseconds. You will get that it is. Uh, ta -ta -ta. 1 million divided by 71.4. The counter will have counted to 14,000. Uh, Oops, what happened? Oops, like this, yeah. So the counter will have counted to uh, 14,005, but actually we would need to do a little bit of a correction because this five happened because we have some rounding error. Um, but generally you can calculate it this way and you will get approximately correct uh, number. I'll write uh, down the second way you could calculate it. So the timer frequency is 14 million ticks per second. So it's 14,000 ticks per one millisecond. So if we did uh, the math with a higher precision, we would get uh, 14,000 ticks. It's just that this number is not precise. We had many numbers behind the coma. So we got uh, a little bit of result but actually it is 14,000 ticks. So if the timer runs at 14 million ticks per second, so in one millisecond, it will be 14,000 ticks per second, uh, per millisecond. And what we could do is, for example, we could um, set up, uh, timer zero to run from uh, MCU uh, clock, set up, for example, um, capture compare register number zero to fire its personal interrupt after 14,000 ticks And in that interrupt, we, for example, turn uh, the LED on. And uh, the third one set up top to fire interrupt after another 14,000 ticks. So it is equal two times 14,000 is 28,000 uh, is the top value. And turn led off from overflow interrupt. So we would, uh, in this case, we would have two interrupts. After 14,000, which we write into the CC0 register, it will fire CC0 interrupt in which we write LED to turn on and the top value should be set to 28,000, which is 14,000 ticks later. It will be after the second millisecond. And in that overflow interrupt, we turn the LED off from the overflow interrupt, right? So this is how we can set up uh, this thing to cycle after one millisecond. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> so, and this is how people <clears throat> would uh, would really do it, uh, and it would work. 
uh, so we have you know kind of done our calculation for this uh, case the problem with this um, technique is that the maximum milliseconds is 4.68 milliseconds if we wanted our led to turn on for five seconds uh, milliseconds and turn off after 10 milliseconds this wouldn't work because our timer overflows so fast that 15 milliseconds don't even fit into its uh, working window. For this reason, all timers also have prescaler. So prescaler basically is just a simple uh, input signal down um, converter, which basically you have uh, some incoming uh, clock signal and the prescaler can divide this signal down two times, four times, eight times, 16 times, and so on. And usually the prescaler just divides the clock by the power of two. So you can have it uh, go into the clock two times, four times, eight times, and so on slower. Let's check it out in the register description. And here you have it. So the prescaler for this microcontroller can have one of these values. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, and 1024. Other microcontrollers maybe, for example, also have uh, divided by 1000, you know, divided by 100 or something like that is also possible. In this particular microcontroller, you can only select one of these values, okay? So let's calculate another example. And you, I will wait answers from you. So, you know, be prepared to do some calculations. <coughs> so we want to turn lead on for uh, five milliseconds and turn off after 15 milliseconds. Uh, so, offer, offer prescaler uh, CC0 and top values. So that's your uh, task. So you know that it will be impossible to run the clock from uh, 14 megahertz directly because the maximum time is only 4.68 milliseconds. So you need to first divide this incoming frequency by two, by four, by 16, some, some value. And then from that slower frequency, you can uh, calculate the CC zero and top value. What you want to do is probably you can try to calculate the period with two times slower clock four times slower, eight times slower. And once you reach the period, which is 15 milliseconds or higher, then you can use that prescaler value, calculate the real timer frequency, and then divide it by, you know, do some division or multiplication and calculate the counter value after five milliseconds and after 15 milliseconds. Okay, so let's do this exercise. The clocks incoming frequency before prescaler is 14 uh, million ticks per second. So you first need to estimate what should the prescaler value be. So let's do it first. So which prescaler value can we use? Uh, 1024, let's check out. 1024. So 14 uh, ta -ta -ta, calculator. <coughs> so 14 million, we divide it by 1024. And we get that the incoming frequency is 13 kilohertz. What is the period? You calculate one divided by this and multiply with 
one thousand, for example, it's zero point zero seven three one four da da da. Okay, so we see that each tick is many times smaller than our fifteen millisecond uh, necessary requirement. So it could maybe work. Let's calculate after how long time will we have overflow. So 14 million, we divide by 1024. So this is our incoming frequency. We calculate one divided by this number. So we get time for each tick and then we calculate, multiply it with maximum number of ticks, 65535 and we get that it will be 4.7 seconds, 4.8 seconds is the full cycle. And actually we can write this down using a prescaler 1024 uh, timer zero operating frequency is 14 megahertz divided by 1024 is equal to 13 let's see da, da, da. So because these prescalar values are limited and a certain set, we really need to do some calculation on paper. We cannot just magically randomly select them. We need to calculate. So 13 million divided by 24 is this 13. Oh, maybe I can copy this value. <coughs> I will write all numbers behind the comma so we don't use lose uh, precision. So it's 13 point something kilohertz, okay? Next, that, uh, next thing that we want to calculate is uh, time of each tick is one divided by F Timer zero is one divided by, okay, I'll write it down here. One divided by 13 point, okay, 13, six, seven, one point eight, seven, five is equal to, I just calculate this and I'll just multiply it with, for example, one million. So these are microseconds. It's 73.14 microseconds. Okay. So each tick after prescaler consumes 73.14 microseconds. Then we need five milliseconds. So uh, N of ticks, uh, five milliseconds is five milliseconds divided by 73.14 microseconds is reciprocal number. I'll convert it now to uh, milliseconds times five. So after five milliseconds at this uh, period, it will have counted to 68, <coughs> approximately 68. Well, it cannot count into fractions. It's a round number counter. So it will count to approximately 68, 68 ticks. Let's uh, just uh, calculate it one more time. So 73.14 times 68 ticks 
is this and we will divide it by 1000 to calculate from microseconds to milliseconds so after 68 ticks it will be approximately five milliseconds in reality it will be 4.97 milliseconds okay and number of ticks uh, for 15 milliseconds is and this i will ask you to calculate how many ticks will this timer have counted uh, after 15 milliseconds, starting from zero. Let's see, maybe we have some answers in the chat. Two hundred and five. Okay, let's check out two hundred and five. So it would be fifteen divided by seventy three point fourteen. Uh, and just, you know, have always write down which are milliseconds, which are microseconds. Otherwise, you can accidentally make mistakes. So 15 milliseconds divided by 0 0.07314 uh, milliseconds, or the same number of microseconds, is 205. So 205 uh, ticks. You know, and you can just uh, recalculate 205 times period of each tick 0 0.07314 and you get almost 15 milliseconds okay so that is correct so for example we can set uh this is hey what is going on no where did it uh, where uh, where did it go what happened it was something like 73.14 uh microseconds t five milliseconds oops it was 68 and n of 15 milliseconds was 205 uh, it's good that humans have some random access memory this 68 we write into this capture compare register number zero so after 68 ticks it will fire capture compare uh number zero interrupt and inside that interrupt code we can write turn on led and exit and after 205 ticks we can write this value to top so when the counter counts to 205 it can it does two things it fires us an interrupt where we write turn led off and it also resets the counter back to zero and the counter starts from beginning after next 68 ticks it will call the next interrupt again and after 205 starting from zero calls the top interrupt okay <coughs> okay now uh this is great and guess what since microcontrollers uh, since basically this is called we could also call it pwm which is pulse with the th modulation pulse width modulation where with the pulse width we control the brightness of led so if the led is on for five milliseconds and uh, off for the next 10 milliseconds 15 milliseconds in uh, total it means that it's basically shining led shines with brightness of 33 percent right 
because five milliseconds on, 10 milliseconds off, five milliseconds on, 10 milliseconds off, you get that LED doesn't shine on 100%, it shines only with 33% brightness. So by changing the first value of CC0 from zero to 205, we can control how many percent the LED shines. And actually the easiest thing to do is basically set top equal to 100 and uh, CC0 is directly the uh, percentage of brightness. Right. In this uh, way, it will not be 15 milliseconds. It will be something like 7.5 milliseconds. But basically, if you set top equal to 100, then whatever number you write into the CC0, it will be the brightness percentage. So if you write zero, it will be zero percent brightness. You write 50, it will be 50 percent brightness. If you write 100, it will basically be turned on all the time it will turn it off and then immediately turn it back on and it will basically be on all the time. So this is how you can use these modern timers to control LED brightness. And it's a very popular way to do. Now let's talk about, uh, so which one is better? In the first case, <coughs> in the first case, our timer had a period of four, uh, 71 nanoseconds. Uh, each tick was 71 nanoseconds. And in the second time, it was 73 microseconds. So it was 1,000 times longer or 1,000 times uh, slower clock. So how do you think, which one is better to blink the LED with this very, very small time or this very long time. What is your opinion? So in the first uh, case, we didn't have any prescaler, so the timer ran at 14 megahertz. In the second case, we had maximum prescaler. It was uh, 1024, so the frequency is a thousand times slower. And uh, so which one is better and which one is worse and why? How do you think? Any opinions? Which one is better? <coughs> so second case is better better is to blink the led slower rather than faster can you also Maybe tell me why. Okay, so you're saying it will overflow less frequently, so less time of CPU will be spent uh, servicing the interrupt servi uh, service routines and uh, the microcontroller will have more time to do other things. So in the first case, our microcontroller would have to turn LEDs on and off after, you know, very short periods of time. If we have, for example, the counter set to 100, after 100 ticks, it will be bothered by switching the LED on or off. And in the second case, it will be bothered only after 100, uh, only every millisecond maybe. That is correct. So less frequent events, uh, ask for less resources from the microcontroller, bother the microcontroller less frequently and it can do better other things. That is one thing that is correct. And what about LEDs? Can the LED even be switched on for 71 nanosecond? 
maybe the time is so short that the LED doesn't even start to shine when it's immediately switched off, right? So these very short periods of time mean high frequency. So if you are blinking the LED uh, at 14 million divided by 100 equals to 140 uh, kilohertz high frequency. So it can start to radiate some electromagnetic uh, noise. So EMC problems possible. So if you run at high frequencies, if you blink LED at high frequency, the frequency is so high, then it can start to radiate and maybe you are radiating in some forbidden frequencies and uh, you might have problems passing the EMC compliance tests. Lower frequency. So for example, one 14 million divided by 1024 divided by 100, it will be <coughs> just 136 hertz. So at 136 hertz, the switching on and off of the LED is so slow that you shouldn't have any major EMC problems. Well, of course, uh, one, one source of the EMC is the base frequency. And the second uh, source of EMC is the sharpness of um, the switching signal. <coughs> So, for example, uh, your signal might be LED on, off, and then for a long time it will stay off, and then it's on and off, and very long time off. So maybe your base frequency is, for example, 136 hertz, which is uh, slow, Generally, there is this rule of thumb, everything that is under 50 kilohertz, not an EMC issue. So everything that is under 50 kilohertz, in reality, rarely causes any EMC issue. It's considered a slow signal, low frequency, and usually doesn't cause any EMC issues. So if you are blinking the LED at 136 hertz, which is 136 times per second, it shouldn't cause you any problems, except the problem could be how sharp are these switching moments? Because the switching moment is the one that can radiate some EMC. So maybe it happens rarely, but if you have very sharp uh, signal changes, these things may radiate. So it, they will just radiate less frequently than at high frequencies. So sometimes when you are uh, switching on and off high currents, <coughs> sometimes you might want to open and close the transistor a little bit slower so that instead of these sharp jumps in signal which radiate emissions maybe you for example want to slow down the switching speed by adding uh, some i'll draw the circuit in a moment but maybe you want to have it switch on like this a little bit slowly and then slow a little bit slowly off and then these uh, switching moments are not as sharp and you have no EMC issues whatsoever because these sharp edges can radiate. So um, to do that, 
the circuit that is very common to drive, for example, long strips of LEDs. For example, you have your microcontroller and you have this timer. And with your timer, you control a pin which switches on and off the LEDs. And instead of one small LED that uh, wouldn't cause any problems, maybe you have 10 meters of LED strip. LED strip. So LED strip, maybe it, for example, has 24 watts per meter and voltage is 24 volts. From this, how many watts do you have in 10 meters? Can you calculate? So 24 watts per meter, how many watts in 10 meters? Let's check out, maybe you have some <coughs> 240 watts, exactly. Oops, 240 watts in total. And at 24 volts and 240 watts, what will be the current that, that we turn on and off? Ten amps exactly. It is a high current, and obviously you cannot power it from the microcontroller. So usually you would have the LED <coughs> LED array. Um, sorry, I don't know. You have LED array. I'll just draw some of them. Two, two, two. First one is connected to 24 volts. Usually they are uh, uh, they are usually switched at the low end with n-channel MOSFET because n-channel MOSFETs are cheaper and better and have better conductivity. <coughs> so let's say we have these LEDs, 10 meters of LED array and so on. And here you would have N channel MOSFET, some big MOSFET, you know, with a good heat sink, 10 amp switching is a serious thing. So like this, B, N, N channel MOSFET. And the gate, you would connect to a microcontroller. So a microcontroller sets the gate high, the MOSFET opens, and the current flows through the LEDs and they shine. And when you set it low, this MOSFET closes and the LEDs don't shine, right? So two things, if you set frequency very high, usually the higher the current, the less capable the MOSFET is to quickly change the state, quickly switch from off to on and vice versa, right? So by switching it very, very quickly and rapidly, it's possible that it hasn't really shut off fully yet when you are immediately opening it up. And as a result, your LED strip might work in a wrong manner, doesn't close fully, the MOSFET doesn't close fully or doesn't open fully, it gets um, to work in a, a linear regime. So the, the, at high frequencies, MOSFET overheats and blows up. I've personally seen that um, if you try to switch high current very, very quickly, the MOSFET just doesn't uh, open and close fully and it starts to overheat and it can really blow up with a flame or just pieces of MOSFET flying around, it's possible. So you actually physically cannot have very high frequencies here. So you will not be able to run it 
directly for, from 14 megahertz, uh, you would usually have the prescaler uh, make the timer run more slowly. So in our case, we would, for example, have maximum prescaler. <coughs> we set uh, the top value to 100 so we can you know, directly control it from zero to 100% brightness. And then this thing opens and closes and the uh, frequency is slow enough that the MOSFET has plenty of time to open fully, then it shines. And then when you close it, it closes fully off and everything works. And so in this case, uh, you know, maybe the MOSFET is really fast and when it opens, so the current changes from zero suddenly to 10 amps. And during this switching period, maybe it radiates some EMC emissions and causes you to bother some nearby devices. So this thing radiates. So to make the edges smoother, what you might be forced to do if you don't pass the EMC test is you put some resistor in series and this resistor will slow down the speed of MOSFET opening and closing. When the MOSFET transistor opens and closes slowly, it gets some extra heat. So you need you can just do this without any tests and calculations. But sometimes it's just necessary to put, for example, a hundred ohm uh, resistor. This is often how people write. 100 and this R means ohms. For example, 100 K would mean 100 kilo ohms, but 100 R is like 100 ohms. Uh, and this resistance will make the transistor open and close more slowly, smoothing out these sharp edges. But it will make the MOSFET transistor heat up a little bit more. So you need to check out that it's not overheating because when it switches on or off slowly, a lot of power dissipates on it. Okay, so be just careful. <coughs> and uh, this, another thing is, uh, if you uh, blink these LEDs too slowly, a human eye can start to notice that these LEDs are not constantly on, but they're actually flickering, blinking. This, uh, if this frequency is too slow, uh, you would see a flicker. And the flicker is not good for the eyes. So oftentimes, for example, 136 hertz uh, blinking, for example, if you set it to 50%, it means it will blink at 136 uh, megahertz. And human eye can notice that at that frequency, it kind of blinks, it kind of flickers. So actually what I've noticed working with LED drivers is that uh, generally a sweet spot between switching speed and flicker is around 500 kilohertz. Most LED drivers that I have seen are actually using, oh, sorry, not 500 kilohertz, around 500 hertz base frequency. So instead of 136, they would use 500 hertz. 500 hertz is slow enough not to radiate any emissions uh, significantly and not to switch the MOSFET uh, on and off too rapidly, overheating it and blowing it up. But 500 Hertz is high enough for human eye not to notice this flickering, you know, that the LED is actually quickly blinking. So higher frequency is a little bit better for the eyes. So for LED blinking, 500 Hertz is what most systems that I've seen are using. Okay, and um, what we calculated here, we assumed that we need to write a code which would uh, 
do an interrupt after certain ticks and we turn the LEDs on and off from code. But since pulse width modulation is so popular and frequently used, practically all timers are equipped with automatic pin change, a pin state change uh, inside the timer. So what we do is we hand over the control of this pin to the timer directly and timer automatically turns on and off the pin of the microcontroller at these top and CC0 values without our code interfering. Uh, so what I told you is possible to do, but the timer peripheral can actually do it for us automatically. So <coughs> when timer counts to CC0, we can assign a pin to the CC0, which will automatically be switched on. And when timer counts to top and overflows, this pin can automatically be reset to low level, for example. And uh, let's check out in the register description. Da, 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 da. Timer status interrupts counter top value. Okay, and here you can see that the microcontroller in its data sheet, when we check out the pinout, um, and we check out the timer, here are the timers, timer zero, timer one, timer two, and timer three. So it has three timers. And each of these timers can seize control over a pin of a microcontroller and set it low and high automatically. But it can only be done to a limited number of pins. So for example, if you're using timer zero and capture compare uh, channel number zero, you can only compare uh, control either port A pin zero or port F pin six or port D pin one, and that's it. You cannot attach this CC zero register to any pin, only to some limited number of pins. And uh, each timer has up to three outputs. So actually you can uh, manage an RGB LED, three color LED with a single timer. So if you uh, attach red color to port F6, green color to port F7 and red uh, and blue color to port F8, you can actually manage them all three with the same timer, just set different values in CC0, CC1 and CC2. And each of these colors will have a different brightness and you can mix them up and have any RGB color that you want. So it's, it's, uh, it can also be used this way to control multiple LEDs. <coughs> and uh, you just have to set special bits in timer route register, which you, which you will do in the lab. Um, and if you do that, you basically give control of the pins to the timer you just change the percentage of brightness in the CC0, 1, and 2 registers, and the LEDs will shine at different brightnesses. And let's see. Blah, blah, blah. And in uh, counter control registers, you can set what happens on capture compare and on overflow and underflow events. So for example, in our regular case on zero, we want the LEDs to be turned on and at some number, we want them to be turned off. So in our registers, we can set, for example, set at zero, which is underflow and at compare match, we want to clear. 
but sometimes maybe we want the opposite action on zero we clear on on match we set so these mo modern microcontrollers allow you to do all kinds of things or maybe you want to toggle to the opposite value so you know it just um <coughs> Uh, there are many, many options on that. So this is the typical usage of timer. So you just have to do some calculations on paper to calculate what the prescaler should be, what will be the period of one tick, how many ticks you need to get certain number of milliseconds. And then after you have calculated all of these things, you can... Uh, you can uh, configure the timer to do these things at your uh, defined moment. Uh, there are also uh, also the timer counter can be used as input pulse counter, but actually I have almost never seen the timer used for that. Uh, for that purpose. I don't know, maybe just haven't happened to see this, so I'm not going to talk about it very much. Uh, but there is a special counter, which is called pulse counter. And this thing basically just counts the incoming pulses. So for example, you can connect pulse counter input pin to a water counter, and on each tick, it will just add one. <clears throat> and after a certain number of ticks, it can uh, call an interrupt and you can just, for example, send this number of uh, pulses to the server. And so the person can go on the internet and check out how many pulses or how many liters of water have been consumed. Uh, so there is this pulse counter, but that will be a little bit separate story. And... Um, <coughs> So for pulse width modulation, we would use these fast timers. And these fast timers only run from microcontrollers fast clock. Let's check out. Mm, which means that when these clocks are running, they are consuming a lot of power. So these are not used in uh, sleep modes. Uh, but that's OK if you need to run the LED. Uh, blinking driver, then it's fine. Usually these timers are used when you uh, have external power supply. But there is a special uh, counter, which as I mentioned is called real-time clock or real-time counter. So the difference between real-time clock and the regular timers is that this thing, it's actually built almost the same as the other counters, but this is a counter that can run from a low power clock. <coughs> and even if MCU is sleeping. Okay, so real time clock is almost the same as the other clocks. It's just that it can also keep running while the microcontroller is sleeping. So when microcontroller is active, it consumes approximately, you know, I'll just write 10 milliamps, you know, approximately. Maybe you can configure it to use five, maybe you can configure it to use 15 milliamps, but for example, these microcontrollers consume approximately 10 milliamps while they are working. So if you are running a device from the battery, you want this microcontroller to do everything it needs to and then go to sleep. So when microcontroller is sleeping, <coughs> It consumes around one microamp, so 10,000 times less. And on one microamp, this uh, microcontroller could uh, run from the battery 
for tens of years because this one microamp is so small that the battery's self discharge rate is actually higher than this. So when microcontroller is sleeping, it consumes very little power. But when it goes to sleep, you need something to wake the microcontroller up after a certain period of time. And for this reason, this real-time clock or real-time counter is invented. It runs from a separate slow frequency, low energy clock signal. So I'll write it down. It runs from separate low frequency, low energy clock and can wake up MCU. And let's check out. So industry standard is that the frequency of this slow clock is F low low frequency clock is <coughs> maybe I'll write it in capital letters low frequency CLK clock is 32768 hertz is equal to 32.768 kilohertz um so it's just a thing from the past, a thing from the history. Um, it is very easy to build counters that run, um, that count powers of two. So as we saw in this, uh, in this example, for example, timer, we have a timer, it has a register, which is called counter. And the register will always have n number of bits. So it will always count to 2 to the power of n. So uh, if we, for example, attach a 32768 hertz clock to a 15 bit register, then it will automatically overflow after one second. So it is really easy to build with this frequency something that overflows at round number of seconds, right? So if you, if you make a 15 bit uh, counter, it naturally overflows at 32768. So let's just check it out. Two to the power of 15 is 32768. So 15 bit counter attached to this clock automatically over, overflows after one second. And historically, these frequency clocks have been used in wristwatches. So if you disassemble a wristwatch, <coughs> let's check out, maybe we have some uh, wrist opsy. So inside an electronic wristwatch, there is always this very, very classic uh, quartz oscillator. And because this electronic circuit, which is inside the clock, uh, had a 15 bit counter, uh, which overflows every second and increments the number of on the screen every one second, um, it was easy to build the quartz at this uh, frequency. So historically, these crystals are just really, really cheap because they're in mass production and they are mature technology. And uh, so this clock is used very often by default in microcontroller world to run these low frequency, low energy peripherals. Um, mm -hmm. um, so, by default, this low frequency clock is just always 32.768 kilohertz, and that's it. Nobody really discusses this issue. So what we can do is we can, for example, configure our real-time clock 
to run from this 32.768 kilohertz, uh, 32.768 kilohertz uh, frequency, we can set a compare value and it will and and put the microcontroller to sleep. And when this real time clock running from separate low frequency, low energy clock counts to that value, it will automatically wake up our microcontroller. And uh, our microcontroller can, for example, every one second do a measurement of a sensor, write down the value, or maybe send it to a computer or something like that. And then it goes to sleep and doesn't consume any energy. And this real time clock <coughs> counts to some value and wakes the microcontroller up every second to do that job. So let's check out real time clock. Uh, it's basically built almost the same as uh, the regular timer, just maybe a little bit less features um, because we don't really need that many features. <coughs> so first of all, this real-time clock is 24-bit counter. Instead of 16 bits, it has more bits so that you can count longer times. And two to the power of 24, is 16 million. So instead of 65,000, it can count to 16 million. So you can measure longer times. Um, it has a prescaler from zero to 15. And you can set the prescaler slow, then you uh, to a high value, then overflow happens after longer time. Uh, but you can measure with lower resolution. And if the prescaler is set to zero, overflow happens faster, but each tick has smaller time and you can get higher precision. So it's a trade-off. And um, so basically this real-time clock has a counter. It just counts up from low frequency clock and it has two compare registers so you can set two different times after which to wake up the microcontroller. So maybe you want one interrupt to happen after one second and the second after five seconds, whatever. Mostly people use just one of these and the second isn't really used. So after a certain time, it just makes an interrupt and that's it. And uh, here's a table which basically says the prescaler value, the smallest resolution, and number of seconds after overflow. So if you set prescaler to zero, each tick is just 30 microseconds, but the overflow happens after 512 seconds. But if you set prescaler to 15, then uh, 32 kilohertz divided by two to the power of 15 is one second, exactly one second. But, and the overflow happens after 194 days. And usually this real-time clock is made in such a way that it, for example, makes an interrupt after one millisecond, approximately one millisecond. And, uh, and it's like a millisecond counter of low energy. And uh, let's just do a little bit of calculation for this real-time clock, let's say, let's say we have a temperature sensor, room temperature sensor. And we want our room temperature sensor to measure temperature every five minutes. send it to server and go to sleep for another uh, one second, please. Maybe it is a courier, so I'll just pause it. 
So 256, the prescaler value, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see, prescaler value, 256. It means that the base frequency Three, two, seven, six, eight, divided by 256 is 128 ticks per second. <coughs> so because this number is two to the power of 15, then these numbers divide beautifully and we get 128 ticks per second. Okay. And now we just have to calculate how many seconds are in five minutes and just divide these two numbers. And then we get after how many ticks we want <clears throat> the microcontroller to be woken up. <coughs> okay. So, five minutes equals to five times 60 seconds equals to 300 seconds, <clears throat> 128 ticks in one second and in 300 seconds, 128. So N five minutes is equal to 300 times 128 is equal to 38,400. And this can be basically, for example, overflow value so that uh, it happens after every five minutes. So the microcontroller sets up the real-time clock to have prescaler of 256. It sets the overflow value to 38,400. Then it uh, measures, uh, does the sensor measurement, sends the data to server and goes to sleep and consumes only one microamp. Uh, this real-time counter consumes something like maybe a couple of Let's actually, let's see, in the data sheet, uh, this information is uh, provided, electrical specification <coughs> and um, digital peripherals. So real-time counter current is only 55 nanoamps. So very, very, very small power consumption. So it only adds 55 nanoamps to the microcontroller sleep current, uh, so it almost consumes nothing. So the microcontroller works for a couple of seconds with 10 milliamps. And then for the rest of the five minutes, it sleeps with one microamp. Then it is automatically woken up by the real-time counter. It does what it has to do. Then it goes back to sleep. And after every five minutes, it's just woken up uh, and does something. And this way, with this real-time counter, which runs from a separate low energy clock, we get this very, very small current uh, power consumption. Okay, so we have studied about the timers in the labs, which are coming up soon. You will, um, you will get to play around with it. So now you can ask some questions maybe, and we can you know, discuss your questions. if you have any questions. Okay, so if you don't have any questions, then we can finish up this lesson and uh, we meet after one week. <clears throat>